Welcome to the Life Career Roadmap YouTube channel. Today with my special guest, Michael Ewan. I'd say her wrong. Now you still time to teach us. Ewan. That's right, yes. Michael. The, it, yes. Please teach us how to pronounce your surname. So it's uh, an Arabic name. So you pronounce it in Arabic as Ewan. Ewan. But if you wanted to, because the English letters do not have the letter Ain in Arabic, so we say Ilwan. Ilwan. Michael Ilwan. 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 I read in myself. <laughs> so, Michael, thank you very much for uh, coming for this chat today. And I'd like to ask you my first question is where you come from and what's your professional background? So I come from Egypt, um, and my professional background is, is quite diverse. So initially, I started by studying uh, accounting, because that was my father's <laughs> that was my father's direction. I cannot say no. So okay, let's do that. Even though I am not good at mathematics, but I still studied it. After four years of studying accounting and finishing my degree, I went to the UK, did my MBA there. And it was in um, marketing. And I worked with a multinational organization uh, as a marketeer and general and uh, uh, um, as an account manager for their uh, business in the whole Middle East. And uh, from there, I, I went, I started there, I stayed there for six years. And then this is where I decided to move elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I came to Australia, worked in different um, industries. So I worked in sales in the um, sports apparel industry for some time. I worked, and then I found my passion in the community where I worked in the uh, in the mental health field because I really resonate with it. I have lived experience of mental illness myself as a consumer and as a carer as well for my mom. So I really, um, I really, it, it's part of my, uh, passion. So I'm really passionate about mental health. Mm -hmm. So I worked in the mental health field as a support worker, recovery worker. Uh, I worked in the Department for Child Protection. I worked as a contracts manager. I worked as a youth worker. Now I am a um, general manager in non-for-profit organization. Uh, it's the it's called Richmond Wellbeing. It's the WA's largest mental health provider. And I'm a general manager outreach in the organization for a couple wow. of years now. Yeah, yeah. well yeah. done. So, Michael, let's come back to Egypt. When yes. you were growing up, so uh, you mentioned that your daddy uh, contacted you to do uh, accounting. Uh, yeah. But growing up, what you had, uh, like in your thoughts, in your imagination about careers? What do you thought you could do? Did you have any idea or you're just like, I don't know? <laughs> yeah, so initially I wanted to be like my father. So my father, he was uh, an, an army general in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that I wanted, I need to look after my mom because mm -hmm. my, my brother at the time was eight years old. So I felt like now I cannot be traveling here and there and leave her. So I decided to stay and study something. But then my dad's wish, if you may say, was that I become um, an accountant and study accounting. He died. And then I felt that it is, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be good to fulfill his wish and study accounting. So I studied accounting while I was looking after my mom. And then by the age of 23, she died. She, she ended her life. And this is where I wanted, I said, okay, I need to do something different. I want to do something different. And I want, and also in the back of my mind, I wanted to challenge mental illness stigma mm -hmm. because partially, one of the main reasons my mom ended her life was the stigma that she cannot, and I couldn't be able to talk about her mental illness. She couldn't seek guidance or advice from anyone. I couldn't do that as well. Mm -hmm. Putting her in a hospital for psychiatric hospital in Egypt is also big, no, no. 
as well. It's a big challenge to do that. There is no psychosocial support in Egypt for people to support people. It's always about the carer or the family to look after each other. And given that my dad died and they have no other people to look after her, I was uh, 16 till the age of 23. I was struggling. I didn't know what, what to do. But in my mind, after after her tragic death, I was like, no, I need to do something. And I need to work in that field because it's uh, actually, you feel like when every time I see a consumer in the mental health field, I, I resonate with them. Mm -hmm. resonate with them as a personally or as because of my mom and I feel like it's a good way of making a difference in people's lives you see right yeah that's yeah. right I agree with you so and then uh, you finish your accounting um, degree in Egypt and going through all these struggles and, and being a carer yeah. because it's a very uh, tough a situation, oh, especially okay. for a young person to uh, be responsible, have a big responsibility. So when did you decide then to, to go to England? Because you went there to do your master's degree. So after my mom's death, mm. I couldn't leave until after she died. This is where I found myself like, I need to move on, I need to open a new chapter in my life. And I love learning. I love education. I love, I'm, I I believe that we are here always to learn and we, we are here to serve others. So um, I started by learning, uh, doing my MBA to learn more about business, to learn more about, first of all, I took it from, when I studied the MBA, it was the first step for me so that I can apply for uh, my uh, my migration to Australia. Because the higher you get, or the more qualification you get, the more points you get, so you can go to, uh, to, to, to apply for migration and get accepted. So for me, the, the, was the easiest trajectory is to build on my business or accounting degree to do an MBA. Mm -hmm. Did I enjoy it? No, but I did it because I wanted to get this, get, uh, get this uh, trajectory of education so that I can get more points. So I will be able to, when I apply for uh, migration, I get the highest possible points I can. And then once I come to Australia, this is where I studied the thing that I really liked. This is the mm -hmm. started my journey in the studies in social sciences and mental health and uh, social work and uh, business leadership and uh, this is where i i felt like now it is time for me to actually study what i want to study yeah and how was for you getting this uh, studies done because it's something that you wanted to do so you had to do things the normally we say uh the hierarchy of values for you was a big value to get where you had a point to come to Australia to do what you wanted. But then enjoying what you wanted is something else, right? And normally people get a little bit confused about what is important, what is a priority, and really uh, they nothing to do what you like, but mainly if you want to do. And you want to do something else, but you just build up in your skills that you had to be able to trust them to Australia and being able to then uh, get uh, the studies that you want to do. So yeah. tell us more about this. So how was the idea of Australia is the place that I want to go? Because you could do the same in UK. What brought you yes. to Australia? Yes, that's a very good question. So when I wanted to migrate, I first of all was thinking either go to America or Canada. And these are the most common countries to migrate to from Egypt. Right? And uh, it was only when I was in Hong Kong in a business trip, and I was in the airport coming back to Egypt, I saw a banner there that has grass and kangaroos. And it says, come to Australia. I was like, oh, Australia? I have not thought about that. It's it's so far from everywhere, right? And then, and then um, 
literally found out that the guy I like watching, which is Steve Irwin, is Australian. I thought that he was not Australian, but he's Australian. <laughs> True, Australian. <laughs> and, doing, and doing the videos in Australia, I thought he's doing it in the Amazons. But yeah, it was really interesting <laughs> to know. Uh, so uh, I thought to myself, okay, Australia, all right. So it's a point-based system. It's a, it's a, actually it's a as a country it's a it's a continent obviously a young con- continent with people where, from from all over the world and it's huge space with um, compared to the population twenty million in a huge space like that so I will I will be living um, in a in a more uh, more I would say comfortable way of living versus going to America or Canada where everything is fast paced, everything is like crowded. Everywhere you go to people trying to, you know, like push each other to, to go through stuff. Um, so that's where I thought, okay, Australia it is. I went to, to um, migration, migration agent. And then I said, all right, I would like to come to Australia. He said, okay, what are your qualifications? I said, here you go. How old are you? There you go. And then start asking me questions. You need to do the IELTS test. I did the IELTS test. You need to get specific degrees in the IELTS test. I did that. Um, work experience, all these sort of things. And then qualification he said, okay. recognized as well? Did you get your qualification recognized? Yep, yep. And having them in the UK was part of my plan because I know that it will be more recognized compared to if you do it in Egypt. So when you do it in Egypt, it's difficult. To get it recognized, then doing it in the UK, it becomes automatic. Okay. Um, so did all that, and then he said, based on your qualifications and experience, etc., I see that you can you can get sponsored by the ACT government mm. uh, in their 190 visa scheme, which means that you get the permanent residency before you leave Egypt, but in return you have to stay, I think, two or three years in Canberra. And I was like, okay, so that's fine. Apply. Is that they say as a punishment, you need to be in camera. <laughs> it's interesting because every time I speak to someone, yeah, every time I talk to someone who knows about Canberra, and before I, I moved to Canberra, he said, You go into Canberra. I said, uh he said, Yeah, rug up, get lots of clothes with you because it's gonna be really cold there. <laughs> That's right. It's really interesting. Wow. So, and and before you come to Australia, uh, what was your you had, did accounting, but you also uh, had a, have a specialization in marketing. Is that correct? So, explain to us how this transition between skills uh, that you could use to to get the job, and what was your job? Okay, so I was looking after the Middle East with regards to the packaging uh, materials manufactured by my my employer and they are they are I was looking at different I was looking after different countries in the Middle East and we had different there are different uh, three or four uh, factories in Europe that manufacture the materials so my role was to be able to fill the gap in the market and innovate and introduce new products in the market so what I used to do I used to go to the UK or or Spain or any other European country and go into the supermarket and start looking. Okay, what do you what do you guys have there in the supermarket? What sort of packaging are you using for your fresh produce? Egypt is well known for the fresh produce. So, and one of the biggest problem is that how you can extend the shelf life of the fresh produce without adding any harmful preservatives or anything so what i found out that there is a very nice product it was like a laser perforated thin uh layer of plastic so it's a a layer of plastic so it's a you get like the you get like the bonnet Mm -hmm. and then you put the, the food inside and then you put a thin layer of plastic on top of it and seal it across and then this layer of plastic has very small holes in it. Mm. And then you cannot see these holes with your eyes. It's laser perforated. And it keeps the uh, the, the vegetables breathing Freshness. so they last longer. 
right? So that was a, an invention in Egypt. So when I gave that to Egypt, yeah. it was really successful and they made a big, uh, it was really, it was really good. It was really good. Yeah. Uh, so you work in that field then. So it would be, it'd be yes. nice to go to the markets. I would love to, to be there in the supermarkets, like watching what was going on here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. so nice. So, yeah. and then coming to Australia, I went to Canberra. I spent three years in Canberra. What did you do in Canberra? Did you find uh, everything in your field? <laughs> I did everything. So I started first uh, working as a um, delivery for pizza. Mm -hmm. Pizza delivery for... I think maybe two months while I was looking for a job. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking for jobs, the first, and this is where I can appreciate the importance of your program, Sima. Because when I started looking for jobs in Canberra, I was thinking when I arrived that, okay, I will be good. I have my qualifications. I have my experience. I speak I'm English. Gonna, <laughs> I, I speak English, yes. <laughs> I'm going to apply. That's it. Finished. Happy days. Well, when I started applying, first of all, I was, um, I first of all, it was difficult to find jobs for people who are not citizens, especially in Canberra, because most of the government jobs there is for citizens. So I was not able, so there's a big section or segment of the markets, employment market that are actually hidden away from me or I would not be able to reach. Mm -hmm. The next, the next, the next thing is that when you apply for jobs, often the the response I received was, "You have good qualifications, you have experience and skill. However, you do not have local experience." experience. And I was like, "What is that? And what 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 would be the difference uh, working in Australia versus working in the UK? I worked in France, I worked in the UK, I worked in Germany." It's part of my role that I used to go and work with, in different countries with different teams. So I was like, well, what's the difference? I couldn't get it. And then the next thing was, um, all right, if there is an employer that's willing to uh, not make a big fuss about your local experience, they will be trying to find a way to say, all right, look, Let's try first and give you a contract for three months or something and see how would you go. And this in itself made you feel like, hmm, people don't appreciate what you can bring. They don't appreciate the, uh, the different perspective that you can bring, the different experience that you can bring. And it feels like, hmm, is this something really I would like? If the, if the employer does not appreciate that, Will I actually be willing to work for them? Yeah. 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 And this is where I was thinking now. If, if the employer will not appreciate what I'll be bringing to the table and treat me like they would treat any person going to apply for that role, I will not do. So if you put if you put on your ad permanent full time, when I apply with you, you don't say I'm gonna I appreciate if you're gonna say I'm gonna have I give you like it's gonna be a probation for three months. But it's different than say that your contract is going to be for three months. You see? Yes. So the whole contract will be for three months. And some of them, they, they didn't even want to write a contract. Mm -hmm. Now, no need for contract. Let's, you, you work with us for three months and let's see how things work. After the three months, we can make a contract. And how you would make money to pay your bills. <laughs> exactly. I was burning my savings. So I came here with savings and I was spending the savings. I worked as a delivery for, for some time, but uh, it was it, it like the, your savings get burned, especially if, you're, if your local currency is not US dollars oh, or yeah. uh, uh, a well, dollar. Dollars, yeah. Yes. So what was, I came here, I think with around $25,000 thinking, oh, I'm going to live for three or four years with this money. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I remember my first job was around $45,000 a year. And then I looked at the first pay slip and I was like, I am going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know how much they would tax you to. <laughs> I'm going to be rich. 
I found myself I'm looking at the bank statement after maybe three or four months, looking at the bank statement, they found that I started with 20, now they are 12. <laughs> I was like, how did it, how, how this happen? So, um, yeah, it makes a big difference, a different perspective. Definitely. Different. So, mm. and from um, camera, yeah. Well, you had a good look around in Australia, the cities, a uh, place where mm. you would be able to live when you could live <laughs> Canberra. So why Perth? Did you came to Perth straight away or did you deviate to somewhere else? And then Perth came to the light of your thoughts. That's really interesting. I was not thinking about coming to Perth. Initially, I wanted to go to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Why Melbourne? I applied... Melbourne's beautiful. Melbourne yeah. is like a multicultural, beautiful city where beautiful places you go to, you can go to beautiful food, delicious food. It's, it's amazing. I love Melbourne. And it's less crowded compared to Sydney. So when I was in Canberra, the, the nearest capital city I can go to was, was Sydney. And I didn't like it. It was really busy. So I said, okay, that's busy. No, no problem. When I went to Melbourne, it was beautiful. I really loved it. And then I was like, okay, if I'm leaving Canberra, I'm going to Melbourne. At that time, I was working in the mental health field. This is where I started working in the field that I like. Mm -hmm. And I started um, studying studies that I like. So I studied Certificate 3 in Community Services, Certificate 4 Community Services, Certificate 4 Community Development, and then I liked it more and more and more, studied my Master of Social Work, and then I liked the management and the lead, the leadership part of it, and I started studying more about, I did my micro-masters in business leadership, micro-masters business in organizational psychology, I did diploma in psychology, um, I, I, did, I finished uh, my graduate the certificate in mental health, and... Um, yeah, now I um, got accepted in the Doctorate of Business Administration in uh, Charles Stewart. So I love I love learning. I love studying. This is what I enjoy. This is the type of study that I enjoy. And when I was working in the field, I was like, this is, that's it. That's what I like doing. I like doing that. So when I was working in, the, in Canberra and I wanted to go to Melbourne, I started for the same jobs in Melbourne. I applied for, I think, 150 jobs, okay. literally 150 jobs in Melbourne. Didn't get any, none. Not even like, a feedback to say, no, thank you. Maybe a couple of feedback. No, thank you. But 150 jobs. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And then I was talking with my manager then, uh, Pip, and she's on my LinkedIn. So I would like to say hi to Pip. She's oh. lovely. <laughs> yeah. And then I was talking to Pip. And then Pip said, well, you know, Michael, I think Perth is really good with regards to mental health, mm -hmm. like programs and uh, community organizations, etc." I said, okay, I might give it a try. She said, go there. Just don't go for looking for a job. Just go have a look how it looks like, how it's looked like. And then I said, okay, that's fine. I had a, I booked an annual leave, traveled to Perth, really loved it, enjoyed it and everything. And then I said, okay, tomorrow I'm traveling back to Canberra. I am going to start sending my resume out randomly to non-for-profit organizations that work in the mental health. You never know. Maybe by the time they look at it, I will be like in Canberra and almost finishing my contract there. So it should be fine. I sent all, all my resume. I sent my resume to many organizations via email. And then four hours later, I got a phone call and then they said, we have received your resume and we were wondering if we can have a catch up with you tomorrow to have a chat. And I was like, unfortunately, tomorrow morning, I'm traveling back to Canberra. I'm sorry. And then they said, can you come in two hours? I said, yes. I said, okay, see you in two hours. So I went there and the chat turned out to be an interview and the interview ended with being offered the job oh. while I was there. And I was like, wow. I, I, they said, this is the, the fastest turnaround for jobs we ever have ever experienced. 
And uh, yeah, I, I went back to Canberra, finished everything, packed everything, put them in my car, drove all the way from Canberra to Perth. Really, you made it away all the, the yes. outback. <laughs> yes. Throughout the oh, it was beautiful. Yes. It was a beautiful experience. Yes. Yeah. So, Michael, so coming to like, we are very fortunate to have you here. Very blessed because you. you are a wonderful human being. And mm -hmm. I have worked with you, you as a mentor for the program. And uh, the mentees are we were always happy to uh, having you and chatting with you uh, as a mentor. So coming to Australia and have this um, desire to be more in, in uh, the human side of uh, work, let's say this way, and coming to the point that we you had your business background, your marketing background, accounting background, and coming to the other side that is more humans, uh, working with social uh, aspects of uh, the community and, and also businesses. And now you are putting everything together, doing a PhD in business and organization. Is that correct? So you are putting yes. everything together and showing that the two sides need to be together. Is that correct? Correct, correct. And uh, to me, it is more about doing something innovative in the sector or in this industry, which I'm passionate about. So um, when I thought about doing my DBA, I was thinking, first of all, I want to get the title of doctor. It's really important. I want to, get, I want to be called Dr. Michael. I don't know why, but I would, love to. I would love to. So I said, okay, I'm going to apply That's for fair it. enough. <laughs> But then I also understand that it will take me three or four years to do that. So unless I'm doing something useful, something motivational, something I'm passionate about, I will hate it. And I don't want to have the same experience that I had before in the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm fortunate to find a great supervisor in Charles Stewart University and another co-supervisor there and another co-supervisor in the University of New England who will be able to guide me in that path and do a, a project in the mental health field, innovative project in the mental health field, which will add or will make a difference in uh, hopefully in the policy and legislation and the practice and in people's lives and, and um, add to to what's happening in in to add to add value to uh, to consumers, and that's that will be my goal. I would love to do that. I'm okay. I'm waiting for for I'm going to start my first um, the first, the semester in this Doctor of Business Administration in in July. So next month we'll start the first um, semester, and I'm looking forward to it. It's really exciting. Yes, and I tell you, uh, when you do a PhD that is very close to your heart, and then you see the purpose of doing it uh, it's a complete different game and I tell yeah. you that because I have engaged uh, in PhD and I didn't feel that connection and I felt there was just a number writing mm. papers uh, mm. And, mm. and like for my, my master's degree I was very connected but for my PhD I lost the connection wow. and uh, I always say if I have to come back to a PhD I uh, I wanted to be more proactive uh, with my uh, writings, especially. I want to write something that you make an impact. It's not just for a paper to be yep. give a rank to university, the university. I want a, this paper to be more uh, in a common language so people can read and understand, yep. right? Yep. So they can make use of it. I know the science yep. is very important. My background is in science, in research, yep. medical research. But I missed a lot the congruence between what I do and yeah. how I deliver it, right? Yeah. So it takes longer for the science to get this uh, message delivered as day to day. Yeah, we understand that. I would like to be more in this side here where I can make the difference and I can see the difference straight away. So uh, for me, it was a completely change a sea change mm -hmm. for me when I decide to quit my PhD to do what I do yeah mm -hmm. so it was it was it was tough many people question me a lot why you are doing this mm -hmm. 
And I say, well, uh, it's the courage of really um, be who I want to be. That's it. That's the most important bit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And if I went to, if, I would like to complete a PhD, but I have yeah, a different yeah. view. And I always uh, play, uh, joke with people from university, if you offer me a PhD that I don't need to go and sit there and watch classes, I am there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Tell me, tell me if you found one. If you found one, let me know. <laughs> yeah, no, I I believe that the experience, especially yeah. having done the research that I have done in the past, uh, talking with people and getting their experience, it's so rich. And if mm. you can translate this uh, mm. to others, and that's why this channel just uh, was born because is translating people's experience so yeah. others can say well nothing is lost i can do whatever definitely definitely and and thanks to your program sima it's actually added to my perspective about things because it gave me the opportunity to reflect on my journey to australia and what i actually what i did and what i would hope that was there so when we were doing the the mentoring so you have the program broken down into chunks and each chunk leads to the other. And each chunk of them is really important. You talk about the culture and the work environment. You talk about the resume. You talk about uh, how you will be able to, how you'll be able to apply for jobs, what, how to address selection criteria. Nobody told me that. It took me a lot of time and efforts and lots of rejections of applications to understand. And also when you start your role, you don't know the culture of Australia. How, how it's like. Yes, it's, there are similarities in, 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 uh, in working in other, other countries like the UK, but there is some stuff that are different as well, you know? So it, uh, without someone guiding you, without someone providing you with this information, it becomes quite challenging. So what you're doing, make it really easy, really smooth and, um, and quicker, mm -hmm. faster. And thank yes. you for accepting being part of it. It was, it was a very good experience. Thank you. Michael, now you came uh, to Australia as a single man. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. then you have created your yes. paradise here. Yes. And you are dead. You have your family. So tell us more about how did you get the joy of enjoying your life here that made you to realize that it was time to really uh, embrace uh, everything that Australia could offer you, including building your family? That's a good question. I was, um, so I, as you said, I arrived here single, really enjoyed my life as a single man, it was really good. And then, you know, the first struggle that you have when you move to a new country, when you start to build your career, you want to build your, um, you want to get a place to stay, you want to familiarize yourself with the culture, have friends and all this sort of stuff. After you do all that, you start feeling mm, something is missing, which is family. It's family, you feel that you want to have a family, you want to have someone is your partner to talk to, to share uh, stories with, to share experiences with, Good or bad, you want to, uh, someone. You want to see uh, your kids. You want to see. Uh, you want to build this home of yours. So when you finish work and go back to home, you found someone waiting for you. You found this connection, and especially for me, I really was looking forward to it because most of my life I was living by myself, especially after my mom's death and all that. So I was I was missing that. So when I came to Perth and I found. Uh, my wife Emma. Uh, we were we we were on the same page with almost everything, which was like crazy. Like how 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 soon we want to have children? How soon we would like to progress our relationship, uh, engagement, and marriage? And I met her parents; they were lovely. I really enjoyed them. I enjoyed talking with them, and uh, her friend, her friends as well, and family. So we found ourselves in a really compatible found ourselves really uh, on the same page. So we progressed, married, and now I have uh, a son. He is uh, three years old. His name is Tariq. And uh, I have a daughter now. She is five months. Her name is Dahlia, after my mom's name. Oh, that's and, so uh, 
I really love. I really love the the now now truly I can call Australia home. Yes, you feel that you are part. You belong here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Michael, you mentioned that um all the struggles that you had when you were a teenager uh with mental health. So you know migration is has its big impact on mental health as well. So what was your situation uh regarding mental health uh through your migration, going to UK uh and then coming to Australia? How did you find uh the point that you felt that you were in the right place? And you could do something else than just be embarking in that kind of uh rambling, rant, like you were just running, running and not going anywhere. Could you explain if you went through something that you and how you found uh the, the exit to be able yes. to keep moving forward? It's a good question. So mainly mainly when you move to a, a new country and it's a new culture, the new home country, new language, new values, new way of life, uh, new climate. Everything is new. You start first um, living in a um, honeymoon period. You're enjoying it. That's fine. And then after a while, you get the culture shock and you start thinking, OK, <laughs> what am I doing here? Is this the right place for me? Will I be able to fit uh, or... Did I make the wrong decision? So questioning yourself, questioning your abilities, questioning your belongingness, questioning your um, skills and motivations to start with to, to come to this place arise in your mind. And that's totally normal. And when I when I started experiencing this, I started feeling, okay, is is what I'm is what I'm feeling and 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 thinking about um, something that I have to live with, or can I challenge it? Yes. And then for me, I was lucky enough to find uh, a church in Canberra that's an Egyptian church. Mm -hmm. So that actually made a huge difference for me because you go to the church, people speak Arabic, people from Egypt, families and friends, you start to build a small community within within uh, Canberra. People you can talk with who understand you, understand your jokes, understand your <laughs> stories, yeah. understand your points of reference, and uh, you feel like at home, but in a different environment. So it's like Egypt has changed and looked as Australia. It's, it's it was fascinating experience for me. So, because I didn't find them straight, straight away. So I, it took me like maybe six months till I found about the church. Mm -hmm. So during the first six months, I was by myself making new friends, making new connections and everything is new, 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 new. And then once I found them, I felt, oh, that's amazing. That's really good. So, it, so my advice to anyone who is coming to Australia new, try to find connections try to find a connection with people who share same culture same uh, same interests same uh, aspirations say this when, the more you found people have more commonalities with you the better mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's my advice so and then um, normally like what i i see working with communities as well communities are a wonderful uh yeah. support when you are new to the country right so you you want to to have that kind of comfort that people are there thinking the same way as you but also there is a trap if you just make that your main point of support right. and you just continue speaking the same language living the same culture you know yes. exposing yes, yourself yes. to the local community to yes. the local experience and then you end up just seeing all the fears that you had before in a new country because you are afraid of mm. exploring it. Mm. Do mm. you see this uh, as also a, something that can go in a different way? It's a wonderful support, but can go in a different way if you don't totally. know how to make things. Totally. And this is where you need to find the balance. So you're right. So I was enjoying... Um, 
having the community and all that, but this does not prevent me from also start continue continue to, to build my like yeah and and the push and the, and grow and it depends on at the end of the day I think it depends on the 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 people in your circle they could help you grow or they can actually let you shrink yes. so I was fortunate enough with people that I met and knew that they were always encouraged me and they share experiences and they share uh, resources they share ideas they share guidance you know and and then that challenges me so I like that some people as you said some people are like maybe okay I'm happy with that which is also okay you know not everybody would like to adventure not everybody would like to challenge not everybody would like to expand or or push uh, their boundaries I respect that as well. I respect that as well. But for me, for me, it was more about I want to grow. I want to learn and push my push myself always further, which I really I love. Yes. So, um, Michael, uh, yeah, we have so many things to talk about you because you are, your your journey is so rich, so wonderful. Okay. One thing that I'd like to ask you: comparing the migration between. England, uh, going to England and come to uh, Australia. What did you see as a similarity and the differences, the struggles or things that you saw that was more difficult here to adapt or was more difficult there? How you see the shocks that you mentioned before, mm -hmm. the big shock for you here, but was the, comparing the two countries? Yeah, it's um, there are similarities, but the difference I think also comes from my intention. So when I was working in the UK, I knew that it was going to be short time. So I was not really uh, fast. I was not really looking to build connections. I was not really uh, looking to get a house or anything like that. It was just more about, okay, I'm going to spend a few years here, a couple of years here, and that's it, finished. In Australia, it's different because you feel like your plan, your intention is to go and build new home, new life in a new country. So it becomes more, um, I, think, I think it's, it becomes more interesting and more challenging at the same time and more enjoyable at the same time because it's you're building from scratch things, which is enjoyable, but also comes with challenges, you know? Um, so I really enjoyed it. It was really a good journey, but between both of them, there are some similarities with regards to culture and uh, and the like, but the difference is was my intention. What I want to do here is different. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned before, uh, gave uh, the uh, perspective of someone in Australia, how they grow. My two questions, no, I have three little questions. The first one uh, into what advice or suggestion would you give to someone who is outside of Australia planning or wanting to come to Australia, what they should think about or what they would do before they come to Australia? That's a good question. There are lots of things there. First of all, they need to see, I, I would really encourage people to seek mentorship first or guidance from someone who is trustworthy, mm -hmm. someone who uh, they can rely on their advice in Australia. Mm -hmm. That's the first bit. Second bit, is based on this guidance, you will be able to plan. You plan as much as you can. There is nothing, there is no bulletproof plan, but you plan as much as you can with regards to how much is going to cost, how much, how long will it take me to find a job, and be practical about it. Let's say, look, look, maybe for example, six months to get a job. Put that in your calculations and calculate how much it's going to cost you for food, for rent, for uh, for outings, for clothes, for transportation, for paying the pills, everything here in Australia uh, you pay for. So there is almost nothing for free. So different than in our cultures and, country, and, and, and cultures. And you'll be surprised when you live in a collectivistic cult culture like ours, you, there are many things that you don't pay for. <laughs> but then when you come here, you, you, you get shocked that every single thing you have to pay for. It's different. But it's a shock. Yes. It's a shock. And uh, so my, my advice is do your due diligence, um, plan ahead, 
and uh, have contingency plans as well. And uh, and if you can, if you can, having this uh, mentor or this guide in place before you arrive is going to be really beneficial because they will be able to tell you about what you might encounter <laughs> and they might draw your attention to things that you might not consider if you thought about it yourself. You see, you're asking someone in the field about the field, you see. That's right. Mm -hmm. And for someone who is in Australia, a newcomer who is here, who has been struggling with their lives to get their lives together and feel that they are stuck, how they can get out of this uh, situation, and especially because there is a big mental health uh, pressure uh, that they need to find a job, that they need to pay the bills. What uh, suggestion or advice would you give to them? I would say, first of all, look look first or be, be honest about how you're feeling. Be honest about what you're experiencing. Don't shy away from sharing it because that's the, the biggest issue is that you feel that if I shared anything, people would perceive me in a in the wrong way or perceive me in a specific way. Do not. Do not. It is part of who you are. If you are experiencing any difficulties, if you're experiencing distress or stress or you're feeling down, it's okay. Say, say, I'm feeling down. I'm feeling stressed. I'm feeling not 100%. Um, and then the true people who actually really care about you will stand beside you in these situations and understand and support you. People who are not true friends or acquaintances or unfortunately sometimes family members will 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 uh, will, will steer away from you, which uh, will also it will be difficult to accept. Diff difficult to experience, but it will show you who you can trust and who you can't, you know? That's right. Yeah. And thank you for that. And my last question to you is, what's your favorite food, Egyptian food, that you, uh, when you think about, you're just like, oh my goodness, I miss that. Oh, uh, now, now I'm going to feel hungry. Now <laughs> Uh, you have lunch already or not yet? <laughs> yeah, well, not yet. But I'm feeling hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> what one is? So, uh, I think it's um, okra. Okra. Oh, with, oh my goodness. Yes, I love okra. Okra. okra with meat cubes oh, yeah. and tomato sauce boiled together uh, with a little bit of diced onion, caramelized diced onion, and then having on the side rice, white rice. With we have what is it like? Um, it's like um, small noodles that you fry them in butter, yes. and then you add them to the rice, and then you add the meat on top. Oh man! Oh, <laughs> do you know how to make it or not? Yeah, yeah, I do. do yeah, I do. I had to because I was living with myself. I had to. Yeah. That's do right. That's right. Yeah. Michael, so thank you very much for uh, your participation here uh, in the channel, uh, sharing your journey, your story, and your perspectives, and inspiring people uh, to really uh, rethink their lives plan their lives and see that there is an opportunity uh, if they really look around and want to find the opportunity that they want. And thank you very much for your uh, participation. My pleasure, Sima. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. So Thanks. thank you very much for watching uh, the episode and uh, remember to subscribe uh, to the channel and see you next. Bye-bye. See ya. <laughs>